All right. Uh, you have a Bible tonight? Okay. Well, I'm getting started early tonight. I, I, last week I picked on you for about 25 minutes and I think I'll lay off this time. Amen. I think it may have hurt my crowd, uh, uh, messing with you a couple weeks in a row. If, uh, you got your Bible, which you should, uh, I want you to turn with me to the book of Philippians chapter four. Yeah. We've been talking about prayer and prayer and prayer. And I don't know how many weeks we've been talking about prayer. Uh, Rob keeps track of that, but we've been talking about different things. Actually, we started a series back, uh, I lost track of it, uh, two years ago, no, it wasn't quite that long, but we started a series dealing with the church, which we ought to understand what the church is and its functions. And I took it out of the book of Acts where it said they gathered together, they continued in the apostles' doctrine, they, they, they continued in the breaking of the bread, fellowship, and prayer. And so when I got to prayer, I said they continued in prayer, and I showed you where they prayed, and then it came to my heart, well, if they continued in prayer, and it was part of the church, and everywhere in the book of Acts, you'll find chapter after chapter, they went to prayer, they went to prayer, they went to prayer. So I thought I'd go ahead and start doing a series on prayer. And that's where we're at, and we've been talking about different kinds of prayer, prayer that changes things, uh, prayers that gets results, and uh, so uh, we talked about the prayer of uh, supplication and petition, but I'm going to look at this thing that some people don't consider as a prayer, but it is part of prayer. It's called Thanksgiving. Now, someone asked me about what I was doing. I said, well, I'm going to talk about the prayer of Thanksgiving and uh, praise. You know, they go together. I'm going to put praise in with another, with another part there. And they said, well, it is getting close to Thanksgiving. I said, but it's not about Thanksgiving November. It's about the prayer of thanksgiving. Everything, everything that God would ever do for you, it really hinges upon the thankfulness of your heart. I believe thankfulness is the key to everything. You know, the Bible talks about, I didn't, I wasn't going to read it, it'd be a great story. There was a woman that came and uh, Jesus was was, was with this Pharisee named Simon and this woman of reputation came in and next thing you know, she started uh, washing Jesus' feet, her tears and uh, this Pharisee said, "If, if if he would really be a prophet, he would know what man or woman this is and pretty much he'd put a stop to it. When it was all said and done, and uh, she went through what she did, uh, he said, now, Simon, listen, from the time I entered your house, you've not so much given me water to wash my feet. And she's washed them with her tears. And he named all of these things. And then he said, whoever is forgiven much, loveth much. So that heart of thanksgiving and gratitude was so strong because she realized of how much she has been forgiven. See, when you don't have much and when you get it, you're thankful for everything. I I, I don't even like uh, being around people for long periods of time that have no gratitude. Gratitude determines your altitude. Uh, I've said that for a long time. Your gratitude, your thankfulness determines your altitude or how high you go. And uh, a lot of people will never go high with God because they're not thankful. The problem is, one of the reasons a lot lot of people don't go high with God is because they're self-deceived when it comes to their spirituality. I figured I'd get no amen for that, and I was pretty accurate. (laughs) Uh, A lot of people don't go because of their spirituality or really the lack of. Because they think they're more spiritual than what they really are. The truth is, uh, spirituality is your intimate walk with God and what you do with God. I've said for years, it's, it doesn't, it's not all about your vocation. It's about understanding your location with God. Well, I'm an apostle, I'm a prophet, I'm, a, I'm this and that. It don't matter what you are. It's not your vocation that gets you where you need to be. It's your location where you are with God. Amen. Where you are with God is what determines it. It's not because I've done all of this overseas with, with a apostolic anointing and, and uh, it's been recognized and people have talked about it. It's not that gift that got me where I am. It's the 
presence of God. It's the position I have with God. Or in essence, as one person says, it's your inner court experience that helps you perform your outer court relationship with God. So what you do in that inner court with God is what gives you the ability to operate in this outer court. But it can't be your outer court perfection that gets you into that inner court. It's that place with God that puts you where you need to be. It's that place with God. And so I think a heart of thanksgiving is what's grateful about it. Amen? Uh, It doesn't matter. I made a decision a long time ago. I'm going to be thankful. I started saying this many years ago. I'm talking now 20, 25 years ago. Uh, I used to say a few years ago. Now now I could say a few decades ago. Uh, That's not really encouraging, but... Uh, it is what it is. But I've made this statement. What have you done today? Not dealing with works, because we know it's by grace. But what have you done today to give the Holy Ghost a right to recommend you tomorrow? What have you done today to give the Holy Ghost a right to enter to recommend you tomorrow? When people bless me, I may not fall down on my knees before God right before them. But do you realize that I've made it a habit? Saying, God, thank you that you recommend me to that person. Thank you that you recommended the ministry to them. Thank you that you were able to recommend the church to that person. Thank you that you were able to recommend us to the lost. Thank you. So what have, what, what have you done today? Talking about gratitude, thanksgiving. What do we do today, and especially with a thankful heart, to give the Holy Ghost, our Holy God, the opportunity to recommend us for something? Promotion doesn't come from the north to south, the east from the west. Promotion cometh from the Lord. It comes from the Lord. Man can exalt you in your flesh, but God's the one exalt you in the spirit. God's the one exalt you in the spirit. I read a quote in England that says, we call it an honor if we're called on by an earthly king to do something. And we call it a sacrifice if we're called on by the heavenly king to do something. I don't ever want to call to do what God called or say when it pertains to what God called me to do, it's a sacrifice. No, it'd be a sacrifice to serve the world and the natural kingdom. It's an honor to serve God. Amen. I've heard people say, I talked about it when I was uh, away, that uh, serving God would cost you everything. I don't even say that. Those words only come out of my mouth. I won't even say it. It doesn't, serving God is what's got me everything. This thing has not cost me everything. Serving God is what's got me everything. When I was working three jobs and couldn't get out of debt, no matter how much I labored, I was always behind, always behind, always behind in a place where people said I'd never make it. I'm talking about doing everything I could in the world, still born again, still serving God, and couldn't make it. When I sold completely out to Jesus Christ and to the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, it hasn't cost me anything. It has got me everything. Amen? Yeah, but you only had a less than $1,000 a month salary when you started off. It didn't matter. It's got me everything. Don't ever look at it. Serving God's a sacrifice. You'll lose a heart of gratitude. You'll no longer have a heart of gratitude. Amen? You no longer have a heart of gratitude. I've got so many little cards that kids has made for me here in this church, and they're stored away. Why would you keep them? I'm thankful. A lot of these kids are already gone and grown and and out. It's been 16 years since I've got some of it, almost 17. So you're thankful for what you do. Now I told you to turn to a text. I didn't pick on you for 20 minutes. I've been exhorting, so this has been different. But we are going to read this text, Philippians chapter four. Uh, I'm not going to go into verse 1. We're just going to go right to verse 4 here because we're going to use this text in another prayer as well. So I'm going to use it to pertain and, and to pertain to what we're talking about tonight. Uh, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Now, this doesn't mean rejoice only when you're up on the mountain. You rejo- rejoice in the Lord always. Now, that's not an easy thing to do. When you would rather slap somebody than rejoice? 
Now I realize that's never been a temptation to anybody here, but somebody streaming may have had that urge one time or two. <laughs> but you rejoice in the Lord always. Always. Amen. You rejoice in the Lord always. And sometimes even when your emotions are hit, you know what you got to do? Rejoice in God. Matter of fact, David in Psalms 103, when he said, bless the Lord, O my soul, it was because his soul was under attack. Not because he was having a Holy Ghost day. Amen. You don't always have to be in the presence of God with, oh, hallelujah, to know that you need to rejoice in God. Some people don't know how to walk with God without a goosebump. That's why they're like a roller coaster at King's Island. Because they don't know how to walk with God without a goosebump. You got to know how to walk with God even in the face of adversity. Come on. Even when somebody looks you in the eye and calls looks you in the eye and calls you a liar. Even years ago when I made a statement to somebody and they didn't like it and they slapped me right across my cheek. I didn't turn it. But I did not respond either. No, you got to learn how to deal with things in adversities. The other guy said, you sinner. I didn't agree with him. It's back in the, back in the mid-80s. You sinner. <laughs> I don't know if I was just so shocked or if it was just a supernatural grace that hit me at the same time. But the point is, you got to learn... <laughs> You're thinking, how do you make these stories up? I don't make these stories up. I wouldn't make these stories up. But you got to know how to rejoice with God, regardless of the fact. Amen? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness or your moderation, one says moderation, your gentleness be known unto all. Unto all. I like to say all men because it's not male, it's men. The Lord is at hand. Let me tell you, let me give you a, a service announcement. The Lord is at hand. I really believe it. Here it is. Be anxious for nothing. Don't worry, don't stress, don't fear. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer, supplication, with, somebody help me. Let your requests be made on to God. So we talked about prayer and supplication, but it said if we just, I just left you with supplication and I just left you with prayer and I didn't add this other ingredient, you wouldn't be able to do it. See, a lot of people say, I, I do, I pray, and supplic- I pray and supplicate, but I don't really get the answer. No, let's add, to an, let's add an ingredient. With thanksgiving. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. So you cannot just petition God according to 1 John 5, 14. You cannot just pray, uh, you know, ask and request. You have to do this with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving, let your request be made unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasseth all understanding, will guard, keep, or garrison your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. So if I want this peace to guard and protect my mind and everything that I have, then I've got to come up with this heart of thanksgiving. So I love, so we, we have a time where we can be thankful. One of my favorite things when my kids were young, and uh, grandkids is another opportunity to show the same things. Uh, there's a couple things that my kids... I provided for them, and that was good. That was materials. My kids listened to The Ventures of Odyssey. I don't know if you're familiar with that. And then Veggie Tales. Veggie Tales are good preaching stuff. Josh and the Big Wall. Madam Blueberry. I'm so bloop, 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 bloop. Blueberry. It stops right there. Madam Blueberry is all about a thankful heart. No matter what she got, she was never thankful until she saw a family that had very little but had a thankful heart. And one day she went to the shop where she bought everything and asked, which aisle can I find a thankful heart? But the thankful heart can't be purchased. Some adults need to go back and watch Veggie Tales. Because my preaching may be too boring, but that one may get through to you. 
But a thankful heart is a grateful heart. A thankful heart is a grateful heart. Uh, you know, when people say anymore, when somebody hands them something and they say thank you, I wonder how far that really goes. Thank you. Is it just a, is it just a, a phrase that we use? It's just a phrase we use. That's kind of like we say to somebody, how are you? We expect the word fine. We don't expect them to break down and really tell us how they are. God forbid. We just want to say, how are you? Not for them to really think we're serious about saying, how are you? We don't really want to listen to how are you. We just want to be like all other people and say, how are you? You know, in Swahili, it's a, it's not, it's very common. Uh, They would say, how are you? They would say, habariyako, habariyako. uh, how, how, how was the day? Uh, how, how was the children? And, and they'll go back and forth. It's not just how are you and walk by. Uh, how is the day? How is the dog? How is the cow? How is the children? How is the path? I mean, everything want to know. Uh, they go back and forth. Greetings are very, are very important to them. It's not like I walk by and Ricky's there and said, how are you? Fine. And we just keep going by. I don't care if he's all right or not. It's just something we say, how are you? And I think sometimes people get the same way with thank you and they're really not even calculating thank you or here's one sorry sorry what what does that mean somebody does something sorry Does, does it really mean anything it's like the word blessed we're talking about thanks i got to give you some filler here thanks blessed When we say, bless you, do we really know what that means? I've said we've relegated the word bless down to a complimentary sneeze. Bless you. What does that mean? Does it mean, don't let that get on me? Bless you. No, the word bless means to empower. If God gave us the ability to speak powerful words, And the power of life and death is in the tongue. If I say, bless you, I'm saying, be empowered. Be empowered to live. Be empowered to prosper. Bless you. And God blessed Abraham. God empowered Abraham to prosper so that he could be a blessing to others. I remember after 911. After September 11th, uh, everybody was saying, God bless America. Everybody. It didn't matter who it was. The lost, the saved, the Republican, the Democrat, all. We're all saying, God bless America. And I remember pumping gas at a filling station down, on, down in Kettering. And uh, I was pumping gas, and there on, on the gas station, on their sign out there, it said, God bless America. Now, I don't know what nationality was in the station, but it said, God bless America. And I'm standing there filling my car up, and inside of me, I heard, translate that. And I said, God bless America. God empower America. I said, for the first time, We had the majority of Americas in unison proclaiming, known or unknown about the fact of the revelation, God empower America again. So we'll say, bless you. I've been on airplanes, people sneeze and people four rows back. Bless you. What does that mean? I don't know. The word love. Love you. Love you too. Love you. Brother and sister, love you. Love you too. You know, you get to have a saying at all time. Your, your time you hang up for your wife, love you, love you. But does that still hold the same meaning when you look at them in the eye and say, I love you? I'm talking about really having a thankful heart. We can't allow this word to lose strength inside of us. 
Because the Bible says, which we'll read in a minute if we get to it, that giving thanks for this is the will of God concerning you. He didn't say that it's something you ought to do. It said giving thanks is the will of God for our life concerning us. So people say, I, I wonder what the will of God is for my life. Being thankful. Giving thanks. Giving thanks. Being thankful is the will of God. So... If we're going to do this, then we're going to understand that we have to be thankful with a heart of gratitude. With a heart of gratitude. When I was in uh, California, uh, that's where I learned the thing about mercy. Two things came out of that trip. This is about 1999, Angel and I, we first preached for the shipments. In July of 1999, we went to a conference in Anaheim. And uh, it was a Kenneth Copeland conference. That's where we uh, spent our vacation at his conference. And never been to Anaheim, never been to California. And it was set up. Somebody introduced me to David Shipman. Never talked to him but one time on the phone. It's all by email. And uh, he wanted us to come and preach for him. And history has been in the making since then. But uh, we rented a car. We landed in uh, in Los Angeles and was in Anaheim and drove all the way to Central California, about four and a half hours to be with the Shipmans. On the way back, if you remember the story, on the way back, uh, they told us if we left at 5 o'clock, we'd get to the tail end of the rush hour going into Los Angeles. Six lanes of traffic. And they said, when you get to the Santa Monica turn, you'll be right there, but then you'll move slowly, but you'll be moving and you'll get to airport plenty of time. So we're driving. We get to that place. Lo and behold, there's lights, tail lights, just at the same place they told us. We're in about the fifth lane over uh, from the right, which is really not a berm. You know, you got like a little sidewalk thing and go straight up houses everywhere. And uh, we are moving about five miles an hour. Now I'm getting a little bit, a little antsy because uh, the planes don't wait for you. All right. And so the lane to my far left, people were just cruising by. I told Angel, I said, that's where we need to be. She agreed. As soon as the car pulled up in front of me, I jotted over, and I was going at a pretty good clip. I was already up to 60-some, and all of a sudden, I saw lights coming. I said, uh, he's after somebody. I said that out loud. He's after somebody. And so a car moved, and I got over, and he stopped right at the rear of my car. I'm in a rental car, and I heard over a loudspeaker, take it all the way to the right. I think he's talking to me. I had no idea what I did. I said, did, did, did we do anything? No, no, I don't know. I don't know. It took me forever to get away. It's like playing Frogger. You get all the way over, and you're up on the side, like on that little sidewalk, and then, it, and then he, he, he comes up to Angel's side because there's no way this side, and he's up on this little, this much of a ledge, and he's looking down inside the car. He says, uh, can I have your driver's license and registration? I said, there's a rental car. I gave him a rental car papers. He looked at my driver's license, and he was plied him, called me by my last name and got it right. Mr. Harbaum, do you know why I pulled you over? I said, I have no clue. He said, you ran through an invisible wall. I went through an invisible wall. I went, it's a good thing it was invisible. <laughs> and... Uh, he, uh, I was shocked. I didn't know. I said, sir, where I come from, we don't have roads like this. He says, I, well, first I said, what do you mean invisible wall? You went through a double of line. I said, I, I said, uh, where I come from, we don't have roads like this. He said, from America? They're all marked the same, sir. He said, you know what this is going to cost you? I said, I don't know. before court cost. There goes the offering. (laughs) And without thinking, I said, I'm looking up at him. I said, sir, I'm guilty. If justice is served today, I owe you, the state of California, $430. I said, but I'm not asking for justice today. I'm asking for mercy. He went, what? (laughs) 
Now, Pastor Shipman said he's never heard this happen. He said, California's bankrupt. They don't let anybody off. So he said, what? I thought he didn't hear me. I'm not exaggerating. I said, sir, I'm wrong. If justice is served today, how I said it, if justice is served today, I owe you, the state of California, the money he told me because I'm wrong. But I'm not asking for justice. I'm asking for mercy. He went, I'll be right back. Then he went to the back, and he sat back here forever. Paul, what do you guys do back here forever? (laughs) That's a secret. (laughs) And so I'm, you know, I'm getting a little antsy. I'm thinking, I said to Angel, I wish you'd hurry up and finish his donut and get up here. (laughs) You know, I've changed since to law enforcement since then. And so he came up and he pressed on me hard. And he says, uh, uh, I'm going to grant you your mercy. I'm going to grant you your mercy. And you know what came into my heart? Thankfulness. It wasn't, bless God, I got to buy with that one. Come on. I mean, I I don't know where that came from, but whatever I said, really, no, I didn't let pride get involved. I became thankful. I became thankful. With thanksgiving and the God of peace, and the God of peace, and the God of peace shall rest upon you. Not only was I thankful, but God taught me something about mercy. See, grace is something that's upon you that helps you not fall. Mercy is when you fall and deserve to be punished. And the one who deserves to punish you hugs your neck instead and says, you're forgiven. That's mercy. Jesus was mercy. And he built a bridge when we were lost and ready to go to hell. He built a bridge between him and God, between us and God, so that we can make heaven. Amen. That's mercy. We didn't deserve it, but mercy did it. <laughs> so it was being thankful. Go with me to the book of Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. That's to the right of your Bible. Thank you, Lord God. I don't want one page too many. Let's go right to verse 2. Continue earnestly in prayer. That's what Paul told them, the church of Colossae. Continue earnestly in prayer. 4-2. Continue earnestly in prayer. Being vigilant in it with... So if we're going to continue in prayer, then there's got to be this heart of thanksgiving to go with it or it don't work. See, let me tell you, if you want to understand... There's something that I found out, and I've done teaching on it. I've done teaching on it here. And there's something that, that I really believe in, and it's called having a heart of submission, a heart of honor. I've said for a long time, you will never operate in authority beyond your submission. Never. This is where people get deceived. This is where they get deceived. Just because they go to church regularly doesn't mean they're submitted to God or even to the leadership that God puts over them. They, they become deceived in that. But you'll never operate in authority beyond your submission. So submission and authority are in direct proportion to one another. They're in direct proportion to one another. That's, that's what happens. Direct proportion to one another. That's, that's the way it is. So, so, when it, so when it comes to this, that the thing that keeps people out of it is pride. And if you read the book of Proverbs, you'll see how God views pride. The the thing that will keep you out of being a thankful person is having pride to invade your life. Because you'll begin to think that people owe it to you instead of you being grateful for what you got. Now, the Bible said pride cometh before a fall. When I see people getting lifted up in pride, I know it won't be long, they'll fall. Pride cometh for a fault in a holy spirit. 
So we understand haughtiness and pride will set people up. Matter of fact, it said pride will bring one low. Somebody asked me, well, what is pride? Is believing a lie about yourself? Pride is believing a lie about yourself, thinking you're something that really, that you may not be. But a heart of humility, a heart of submission, along with a heart of thanksgiving will take you from here to where God wants you to be. On a one-way track. That's what it will do. So I tell people, what, whatever you do, stay out of pride. Matter of fact, one of the works of the flesh is pride. You just got to stay out of pride. Now, we can be proud of someone, but we got to stay out of pride. Pride, deception comes with pride. And like I said, pride is starting to, it will be something that you'll begin to believe a lie about yourself. So continue earnestly in prayer. Be vigilant in it with thanksgiving. So God wants you to do this with thanksgiving. Now, the Bible says when it comes to intercession, we did this verse in Timothy. First of all, prayer, supplication, intercession, and giving of thanks. Let your requests be made known for all men, for those in authority, for kings, and on down the line. That's what you have to do. So when I pray, I told you that when I took, gave you an example and I took you into my prayer time, I would pray that prayer. Father, I thank you. After I do spend some time in worship, I thank you. First of all, you said first of all, not second, third, fourth. First of all, with prayers and supplication and intercession, I'm going to supplicate. I'm going to pray. I want to stand on behalf. Prayer, supplication, intercession. Let your requests, petition be made known to all men for those in authority, for kings and priests. So prayer, supplication, intercession with thanksgiving. Prayer, supplication, intercession with thanksgiving. So I would always stop there. Let my requests be made known to all men. This thanksgiving, I'll say, Father, especially with thanksgiving, I thank you. I thank you that I have the opportunity to stand before you. I thank you I have the opportunity to pray. I thank you that we get the opportunity to pray on the behalf of our leadership, our government. So I begin to pray, God, I thank you. I thank you. That's how I pray. I thank you for, now some presidents have been hard to say this for. So I don't pray because I agree with them or because I think they're doing right. I'm just obligated to pray. To pray and to stand. Pray for those in authority, for kings, for priests. We don't have kings, we have presidents. So I thank you. I thank you. I pray for the president of the United States of America. I pray for him. I pray for protection over his life. I pray for his family. I pray for his cabinet. He, he elected these cabinets. I pray for those who bring him information. Whoever has his ear controls his life. I pray that the information that gets to him uh, that will be filtered, that uh, uh, it will come in a way that he'll understand what's going on. Sometimes it seems like the prayer never works. I understand that, right? But you still got to keep praying. You still got to keep praying. You still got to keep praying and believing. And I said, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for him, for his family, for his cabinet. I pray for the legislator. I pray for the judicial system. I pray for both sides of the aisle. I give you thanks. I give you thanks. Because if you don't allow certain things to transpire, you can get in the flesh. I can say I can get in the flesh real quick. Because I don't like the way some things are done. But a thankful heart will keep you in check. I've told more than one person that complains about the government. And we all can complain. There's people complain about me. But the point is, if you're going to complain, may you be one also that prays. That prays. And you still have a heart of thanksgiving. Because as bad as it is, it could be worse. Oh, yeah. As bad as it is, it could be worse. Amen? So in a few weeks, don't forget to vote. Side note, sorry, that was not real spiritual. It's just a fact. <laughs> Amen? Don't forget to do it. So this is what we do. We have to do this with Thanksgiving. Can, can you stand another verse or two? I got one. I got one. Two, three, four, five, six. We won't get to all of them. But let's get to at least one more. First Timothy. First Timothy. You know where First Timothy is? Right before Second Timothy. First Timothy chapter four. First Timothy chapter four. <laughs> Let 
Start in verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says, or King James says, expressly speaketh. The Spirit Spirit expressly says, or speaks expressly, some would say, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. How many, does, does anybody believe that's going to happen? Mm-hmm. Why? Because they heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. It didn't say influence of devils, it said doctrines. Doctrine is something that's taught. What are your doctrines? Doctrines is a belief system. A belief system comes because things are taught to be a belief system. Okay, so that means doctrine of devils is going to be humans influenced by the wrong spirit teaching things that sounds right, but it's going to be deceptive. Doctrines of devils. Demons are not going to get up and act like professors, but they will influence people to cause people to move away. To me, if somebody tries to convince you, I don't care how many books they wrote, how big our television broadcast is, to try to tell you that certain parts of the Bible is not for us anymore, and you wouldn't have to obey that, I would say, I'm not listening to that doctrine of devils. Come on. See, I'm not picking on you. I'm just picking on them now. So we're all still good. Seducing spirits and doctrines that will speak in lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry. This is what they teach. Forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from foods, which is created to be received with by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good. Every creature is good. To me, I don't have a problem with it. Pork, bacon is all good. For every creature for God is good. And nothing is to be refused if it is received with. What happens when you receive a thanksgiving? It is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. If anybody's ever had a meal with me, this is how I pray. You're saying, how do you pray over food? Right here, it tells us. Everything is meant to be received with thanksgiving. I may say it different, but it will always come out the same way. Father, I thank you. I thank you for this. Number one, we have the right to declare. I declare it blessed with a heart of thanksgiving. For if I have a heart of thanksgiving, everything we eat and drink is sanctified by your word and this prayer that I pray. So there's many ways that people do it, but the way that I see talking about food It is sanctified by the word of God in our prayer with a heart of thanksgiving. So that's why I say, God, I thank you. I give you thanks for this food, for therefore it is sanctified by the word of God and the prayer that I pray. That's what I do for food. It's simple. So people don't realize thanksgiving is an attitude of the heart. It's gratefulness. I thank you for this food. And man, there's been stuff set in front of me that I've had to be really thankful. (laughs) And it wasn't so much for the food. On the island of Sumatra, when I know I had to eat dog, let me tell you what, the only thing in that room was thankfulness because there was no other desire for anything else. (laughs) It was rough. That's exactly right. (laughs) I can't even people... Tell them on punchlines around here. We got it. But I'm telling you what. I mean, there's things that I knew. I had a team with me. We were in the, in the back part of Kenya, and they didn't have bottled water. And I said, let me drink it first. And I looked at them. I said, no. But I sat there and drank that with a heart of thanksgiving. Man, there's time my stomach would cut and tear for like days. But I'm telling you what, I kept believing in that I give thanks for this. I give thanks for this. I give thanks for this. Therefore, it's sanctified, set apart. All impurities is set apart by the word of God in prayer. If you want to pray biblically, this is how you do it. It's thanksgiving. Amen? It's thanksgiving. I mean, it's easy to thank God for that big bowl of ice cream. Oh, I thank you. It is sanctified. (laughs) 
but some of that stuff we've ate, we had to eat overseas. I have a hard time. You know, now, you know, there are certain things here. I, of course, here I don't have to offend anybody by telling you, I don't care how you fix your sweet potatoes. They're not any good. <laughs> but you haven't had mine. Yeah, yeah, I've had everybody else that said that. And they still taste like sweet potatoes. Sauerkraut. Oh, my God. There will be no sauerkraut, sweet potatoes, red beets on that banquet table in heaven. (laughs) No, they won't. (laughs) See it, doctrines of devil. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. There's times where recently I was in a place and they, you know, they want to honor you and cook things. And so uh, one, of the, one of the delicacies, it's a real sacrifice when they cook that goat for you. And uh, sometime that goat comes and smells like nice roasted meat and you're thinking, your mouth begins to water. And other times they pass it by you and it smells just like the real goat. And you know it's going to taste like that real goat. And you're sitting there and you can't get it swallowed down because it tastes like it smells. And, and uh, thank you, Jesus. Mm. No, you got to have a heart of thanksgiving with this. Uh, it was pretty good on this last, not this last trip, but earlier this year we had a very good trip. So... But here it is. It says, for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it is received with. You know what it didn't say if it was received just by faith. Because if you have a thankful heart, faith will always work. Unthankfulness will stop faith in your life. You write that down. Unthankfulness will stop faith in your life. Because faith and pride, thank, faith and unthankfulness, uh, they're, they're not going to flow together. So if you want a life that flows with faith, then you have a heart that flows with gratitude. You have a heart that flows with thanksgiving. Amen? You have a heart that flows with thanksgiving. That's why I've said every time there's a pastor's appreciation, every time there's a birthday and anniversary, I'm thankful. We put it in the bulletins and all. We don't do that because we have to. We do it because we do it. Angel and I read every card, and we're thankful. Not just the cards that have something in it, but the cards that has no monetary in it where people would say, but the words that are spoke, we're thankful. We're thankful. So it doesn't have to be dollars and cents to be thankful to be thankful. Come on. So there's something about faith flowing out of a heart of thankfulness. That's what it is. So if you let that heart flow with thankfulness, giving thanks, I wrote this down so I wouldn't forget it. Giving thanks is a key to total victory. It's a key to victory. It's not just confession. It's not just faith. Now it's thanksgiving. God, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I've walked in this church hundreds and hundreds of times. God, I thank you that I have favor with you. I thank you that I have favor with you. I thank you that I have favor with you and man. I always, I don't know, I just have that word Thanksgiving coming up in me. I don't know how many times I've prayed, and I almost go in this order. God, I thank you that I have favor with you. I have favor with you and man. You said you would cause us to have favor with God and man. I have favor with you. And after I say that between God and that verse, you know who I say next? God, I thank you that I have favor with Angel, my wife. I thank you. I thank you I have favor with her. I thank you I have favor with my children. I thank you I have favor with my pastor. I thank you that I have favor. I'm thankful. Faith works for this thankfulness. I thank you. I thank you I have favor with my staff. I thank you that I have favor with my leadership team. I thank you that I have favor with the people that tend here. I thank you that I have favor with this community. I thank you I have favor with the government of this county. I thank you I have favor. I thank you that even my enemies are at peace with me. Here's my list. It comes out of me because I've said it so many times. Well, why do you need to be thankful have, that you have favor with your wife? It's a good thing to have favor with your wife. 
Amen. It's a good thing. Some of you men ought to start praying that. Be thankful for it. Especially if you want to buy a boat. Now, now see, that's a doctrine that we need to be adjusted. <laughs> so anyway, that's what it is. Let's go to one more verse. We got two minutes. I think I can do it. Let's go back to the book of Colossians chapter 1. I should have caught that on the first go around. Colossians chapter 1. This is Paul when he opened up this prayer at this time for the church of Colossae. And uh, let's read the first few verses there. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Then he goes on to say, we give thanks to God and the Father of Lord Jesus Christ, praying for you always. We give thanks to God and the Lord Jesus Christ praying for you always. Now, if you read the book of Ephesians, you read the book of Philippians, you read the book of Colossians, you read the book of Galatians, everywhere where Paul prayed for the churches, he always started off, I give thanks to God for the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for you. Folks, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that I get to, Paul said, I thank my God that he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. I'm thankful that he counted me faithful, putting in the ministry. I'm thankful that he found me faithful to pastor this church. I'm glad he found me faithful, and I'm thankful that you attend this church. I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful that there's a, there's a congregation of people that love God enough that's willing to go out beyond herself to help change the world. I'm thankful for that. Churches that are totally internal, I I, I, I see it every day here. They're all about their self, internal. They're declining, they're decreasing, and their money is almost gone because they have no outward, they have no outward vision. The same thing works for individuals, works for churches. God will provide seed to the sower. It'll work for you as an individual, and it works for us as a church. You're a sower. He gives you seed. That's why when you continue to give seed here, the church is a sower and continues to provide. Amen. Amen. So I'm thankful. I have a thankful heart, and I thank God that we get to stand here and serve him together. And I'm thankful that we get to welcome people here a week from Sunday and show them the love of God and bestow upon them honor for what they have done for the kingdom. Amen. I'm thankful. So let's stand.